Well, Carlos, yeah. the floor is yours. Yeah. Okay. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to this talk. Um, uh, as you all know, mutations in DNA have consequences in the functionality of proteins that are the final effectors of the structures contained in our genome. And however, uh, protein function can be altered by post-translation and modifications in response to physiological, but also pathological situations. This is relevant in pathologies where no DNA mutation could be associated with the development of the disease. However, to study these modifications in different pathologies is harder and definitely much, much more expensive than studying their genome. Our today's speaker is an expert in a type of protein modifications that is the conjugation with ubiquitin and ubiquitin-like molecules. He has published many articles about this topic in the most prestigious magazines. Dr. Ciro Dimas received his undergrad, uh, undergraduate uh, degree in molecular biology in 1996 uh, uh, from the University of Dundee in Scotland. And he continued his formation there, uh, working in two different laboratories. And in, in 2005, he was the recipient of a fellowship from the Association for uh, International Cancer Research to develop an independent research team in the Center of Gene Regulation and Expression at the University of Dundee. In uh, 2011, he moved to France and there he was recruited to, uh, to be a um, um, research group leader in, in uh, Cell Biology Research Center in Montpellier in France. So today, Dr. Silodimas is going to tell us about the relevance of ubiquitin-like modifications in cancer and its possible exploitation as therapeutical targets. Well, Dimitris, thank you for attending our call and well, your audience. Okay, thanks a lot, Carlos. And thanks also to, to, to Natalia for organizing this meeting. It's, it's a really great pleasure to do this, even if I would prefer to come something there because uh, I have personal connections there and I love, uh, you know, North Spain. So, uh, but now it's, the way that we have to do things. Um, so thanks very much for the invitation. So as, as, as um, Carlos said, I mean, our group is interesting on, on uh, post translational modification of proteins with a, with a small family of proteins called ubiquitin and ubiquitin-like molecules. And today I'm gonna focus, uh, I'm gonna give a more broad introduction to the field. Uh, and I will uh, try to, to give you some uh, overview of, of our search on on the ubiquity-like molecule net aids and how we can use this pathway uh, for therapeutic intervention with, off, you know, with focus in, in, in cancer. So, so this is this is highlighted the, the you know highlights the basic sort of dogma in, in, in biology, where from uh, DNA go to RNA, and, uh, you make proteins where they, they are the workhorse of uh, in cells that they execute all the all the functions in, in the cells and you elicit the biological outcome. But now we know that um, these this pathways are constantly challenged by, by actually uh, intrinsic or, ex, or extrinsic uh, stress, which we define now as genotoxic or prototoxic stress. So basically damage that happens to DNA or RNA or damage that happens to proteins. So cells have developed a, a highly sophisticated uh, processes in order to detect and repair in the case that the repair cannot happen to eliminate both DNA or protein damage. And this is very critical because, because if that doesn't happen, if you, if you sustain both protein damage and DNA or RNA damage, this goes to pathology. And of course, you will know that uh, DNA damage can call to cancer, to cancer where protein damage is well established for the creation of new generation. But also I would just show you that uh, that also protein damage can be involved in, in cancer pathology. So now we know that this family of ubiquitin and ubiquitin-like molecules are absolutely essential in all these processes of how the cell detects, repairs, and eliminates uh, you know, uh, damage from, from the cell. So um, as, as Carlos said, I mean, so this family belongs, this family belongs to, to, to over 200 types of post processor modifications that exist that exist in, in, in cells. But the, the sort of unique aspect of these post translational modifications is that here we're discussing about a small protein that is conversely modified to another protein. So normally 
the poster's laser modifications that we are all more aware of. They are all sort of chemical or lipids that are modifying proteins. In this case, we have a protein that is modifying another protein. And this also, from an evolutionary point of view, it's quite interesting because these molecules themselves, they are actually subject to uh, evolution and changes. So you can imagine that these, these molecules can actually change, if you like, the biology with, with, with evolution, which is in contrast, for example, with phosphate uh, groups that basically they are, as far as the evolution is concerned, they are, they are evolutionarily dead. They cannot, you know, they cannot change. Now, the key question now we know that these pathways, for example, if we take for example ubiquitin, they're involved in the regulation of every biological process you can think of. And if there's something that is not controlled or we don't know, it's probably because it has not been studied. So these pathways are really involved in the regulation of, of, of any biological process. And the key question here is how a single protein can be involved in the regulation of so many biological processes. So if we take ubiquitin as an example, and this is you know, quite, quite complex, but I will try to go through uh, a bit in a simplified ma manner, is that ubiquitin, as I said, can modify Postas laser modify other proteins as a single moiety. But also because ubiquitin is a protein itself, it can also modify itself. So it can, it can cause what we define now uh, the, 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 the ubiquitin chains. And what is interesting here is that depending on which sort of residue you use on ubiquitin to make this change, you create a completely different signal for the cell that is involved in a completely different uh, biological outcome. So, uh, so here I just give you like a very sort of overview of summary, if you like, of biological process that controlled by different types of ubiquitin chains. But I guess the one that you're most aware of is that the function of ubiquitin chains to cause or to target the, a protein, the modified protein for protosomal degradation, to eliminate it, to eliminate this protein, the modified protein uh, from, from, uh, um, uh, from the cells. So, so here, uh, so here I, I will just describe a bit of how these ubiquitin molecules, they're really involved in elimination of, of proteins from, uh, from the cell, what, what we call in actually as the protein quality control system and how ubiquitin is impinging of controlling the state of the proteins in the cell. So as I said that um, the cells are constantly exposed to stress, in this case, protoxy stress. And here I just highlight a few examples, even DNA damage that we know is inducing you know, protein damage. Uh, chemotherapeutics that are worse in the clinics, they're also, uh, you know, protein damage, oxygen species or elevated temperature. And the key characteristic is that uh, all these stresses, what they do is that they're causing the misfolding of, of, of native proteins. And here the system has to detect and repair uh, this protein damage. So there's a whole sort of family of proteins called the chaperones, which they detect these uh, misfolding proteins, and either they try to refold them back into the native state, or if not this possible, they're using the ubiquitin system in order to modify these misfolding proteins with what I said, the ubiquitin chains. And this now acting as a signal to degrade these misfoldings in the cell. So the protosome is one of the key uh, machineries that degrades, that recognize ubiquitin native proteins and degrades them. And also the autophagy system Now we know that uh, it can also be involved in the clearance of misfolding proteins. So of course, this is critical because if these proteins, misfold proteins, they're not sort of degraded, eliminated, they will accumulate potentially as uh, aggregates in the cell. And now we know that the, the formation of uh, uh, aggregates, irreversible aggregates, insoluble aggregates of misfold proteins, they are involved in pathology. Or the, I mean, they are regarded as a hallmark of new genetic diseases. So again, you can see how the ubiquitin system is, is critical in order to prevent sort of uh, this, uh, this, uh, this pathology. But what is also now clear is that also in cancer, uh, the, cause, the, 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 the creation of these folic proteins is also part of the pathology. So for example, as Carlo mentioned, I mean, many, many, many mutations that uh, they, 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 are, they, they are found in, in cancers, they, one of the things they do is they're causing protein misfolding. And what happens is that in this case, when you increase the percentage of, prot of protein misfolding in the cell, you increase the load of proteins that has to be degraded. So basically there is a, a great dependency on the protosome to degrade and increase load uh, of misfolding proteins. So this is why we believe that many cancer cells, they're extremely sensitive to the protosome function. 
because now the protosome is oversaturated, if you like, from the creation of misfolding proteins due to the mutation. And now these cancer cells, they're becoming, they're super sensitive uh, and depend a lot on the activity of, of, of the protosome. And this, if you like, you know, provided, if you like, initially the, the evidence that by blocking the activity of the protosome, we can actually create now a, a specific cancer therapeutic approach. And indeed, uh, uh, the, the compound that probably, you know, bortezomib or Velgate is a specific inhibitor of, of, uh, of, of, of the protosome that blocks the degradation of, of, of proteins in the cells. Uh, it's, a, it's a reversible inhibition. It was approved back in 2003 uh, for uh, treatment of patients with elapsed or refractory myeloma. I have to say that the, the, the clinical trials had to stop prematurely because the compound was so effective that it was regarded as unethical to keep uh, the, the clinical trials on. So it was a super fast, uh, it was like basically like the, the, the vaccines that we have now for COVID that they went through the clinical trials extremely fast because of their success. And of course, of the, of the, of the pressure that we, we have in society. So now these compounds, this Velgate is now it's an approved and a commonly used drug for multiple myeloma, a, a, a mandel cell lymphoma. But something interesting about this compound, and maybe we can discuss this later, is that it doesn't seem to be so effective in solid tumors. And now people are trying to understand why uh, uh, this compound is so effective in this type of tumors, but not in solid tumors. But nevertheless, this, this proved, provided a very strong proof of principle that by targeting the ubiquitin system, you can actually devise uh, uh, therapeutic approaches you know, for cancer. Now, Ubiquitin is it's, it's one of the members of now of a growing family of proteins, which we call them ubiquitin-like molecules. So these proteins are very similar to ubiquitin. So they, they, they have very similar structure, but of course they have their own independent functions. So here I just highlight a few. Uh, the ones that is, they're more sort of studied at the moment is SUMO, uh, uh, NED8 and IG15, and of course ATG5, which is invo involved in, uh, in, in, in autophagy. Now, uh, the key thing about, uh, about this, this, these molecules is that they have, if you like, their own unique uh, conjugation pathway in order to modify substrate uh, 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 of, 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 of interest in this case. So here just highlight that the, this, this, this conjugation, these proteins are modifying substrates using the three key enzymes, which we now refer as U1, E2, and E3. So these are three enzymatic activities that they pass, in this case, say ubiquitin, from one enzyme to the next, till eventually the E3 enzyme, which is we call the E3 ligase, is the one that directly binds the substrate and convalently attaches ubiquitin on the substrate. And what is critical here is to mention is that each molecule has its own unique enzymes for, for modification of the substrate. Now, it's based on the success of the board of the bortezomib, you know, Velgate uh, in clinical in, 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 as, as a cancer therapy. Now, many pharmaceutical companies now, they decided to target all ubiquitin-like molecules. So now there's a series of inhibitors that they specifically inhibit the E1 enzymes, the first enzyme in the cascade of each of, 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 of these of this pathways. So basically these inhibitors, what they do is they completely block the conjugation of, in this case of ubiquitin or NED8 or SUM, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so all these compounds now, they are in clinical trials now, uh, but what I would focus, uh, Today is on the ubiquitin-like molecule in a date, and particularly on this um, compound, the inhibitor of this system, which is called MLM494 or Pevonedistat, which is its clinical uh, uh, sort of name, and how potentially we can use this uh, these compounds on, on um, uh, you know in in cancer. So, so first I will just give you a bit of introduction of the NEDATE pathway. Um, I will give you an example of how, like a bit of basic research of how potentially the NEDATE system can be involved in. In, in cancer development. And the second part of the talk, the last part would be how potentially we can use a strategy to use these inhibitors in the clinic. Now, so the next pathway, as I said, it has its own E1, E2, and E3 enzymes to conjugate substrates. And now we know that the, the proteins that are modified by NADATE, they're belonging to, do, to two different classes. We have the Kalin family of proteins. So these are uh, uh, a small family of proteins that belongs to um, an E3 ubiquitin ligase family. So they are scaffold proteins. And when they're modified by a date, they have increased ubiquitin activity to degrade proteins for protosomal degradation. So in this case, what NED is doing is stimulating ubiquitination of proteins through modification of this, of this protein, you know, calyx. 
But also now we know uh, from proteomic studies that we've done ourselves and, and other groups that there's many non-Kaline, as we call them, substrates, which now we think there are more than 1,000. And also, I know that Carlos is quite interested in this to develop uh, sort of really innovative approaches to, to specifically identify uh, net date substrates in, uh, in, um, uh, in cells, because that's critical if we want to understand how this pathway really works and how inhibitors of this pathway elicits, if you like, anti-tumor activity. Um, so, of course, because uh, what we knew at the beginning is that the net date pathway somehow, as I discussed, they can control the, ubiquitous, the degradation of proteins and based on the success of Velgate, uh, they decided, the companies decided to develop an inhibitor for the net date pathway, uh, which is now in phase three clinical trials for multiple myeloma and also solid tumors. And what this compound does is specifically uh, inhibits uh, the E1 enzyme for net date. So basically completely blocks uh, the net date pathway in cells. Now, what is also critical to understand here is that these pathways, they are very dynamic. Very, and they, so what I described so far is that how these molecules they are through the activity of the E1, E2, and E3, they modifying substrates, but the reaction is irreversible. I mean, similar to you know, phosphorylation, where you have the kinase and the phosphatase, the system has the so-called deconjugating enzymes, which basically they remove uh, the, the, the molecule from the substrate in order to release, in this case, NED from the substrate, and you can reinitiate the cycle of, 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 of conjugation. So for NED, uh, we have two type of, um, of, uh, of enzymes, of deconjugated enzymes. We have the COP9 signalosome and NEDP1. And now we know that the COP9 signalosome is dedicated to remove NED8 from kalins, where the NEDP1 is mostly specific in modifying, in removing NED8 from non kalin targets, all the thousand substrates that I just described to you. Now, an interesting thing about NED as well is that it's a similar to ubiquity and also can make uh, this, uh, this NED8 change. And now we have evidence, and I will show you some data uh, in a minute, that the pathway is upregulated in, in a variety of cancers, which is highlighted so here. So it suggests that maybe in a, the, the increase of nedulation um, may act in, as a non cogen if you like, in these tumors. And of course, its inhibition by uh, an inhibitor might have an anti-tumor activity. So key questions that we want to understand in, in the lab, and I guess um, in, in the field at this moment, is that, what is the molecular basis of the nedulation defects in cancer? So why NED8 is increasing in, 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 in cancers? And is, if there's any system that basically can detect this misequilibrium of NED8 that, they, that uh, is occurring in cancer. So basically if there's a pathway in cells that can detect that the NED8 has been upregulated and how the system responds to this upregulation of, of, of NED8. Now, so here, I mean, what we've done is we have the collaboration with, uh, with a group of, uh, of uh, Malou Martinez-Santar, which is not so far away from Santa Dels, it's actually Sig Sip, Ogun in, in Bilbao. And what uh, Marina Serrano, a PhD student in Malou's uh, lab, what she did is she, is she actually monitor this upregulation of net data that in cancers that I just described to you. So here, what, what, what uh, the group of Malou have done is they created a hepatocellular carcinoma model system in, 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 in animals which is based on the deletion of this transcription factor over here. And these animals develop uh, liver cancers, spontaneous liver cancers. And what, what Marina did is she analyzed, and this is a Western blot where you basically look uh, the net date levels, uh, the net date levels in either control animals or in tumors. And I think you can appreciate um, that in tumors, you have an increase of protein ventilation consistent with the idea that the net date pathway is upregulated up uh, in, in tumors. Now, what is interesting is that Marina found, we think that she found the molecular basis for this increase of, of, of NED8 in, in these tumors, because she found that specifically in the tumors that she created, the levels of the deconjugating enzyme P1, they're completely gone. So basically the enzyme that removes NED8 from substrates is deregulated in, this, in these tumors. And that now provides an explanation why in these tumors, you have this accumulation of NED8. Now I can tell you that this of course happened, we see this in animals, in mouse model systems, but we can see this very similar thing and we can re recapitulate this in vitro, in tissue culture cell lines. And here I just show you uh, one example of, uh, of a cell line, of an osteosarcoma cell line, that if we delete, uh, if we make a CRISPR knockout of this denodilated enzyme, 
we see this massive accumulation of nidate, uh, very similar, if you like, to what we see in, in tumors. So clearly this enzyme is very important for the cycle of nidate. And of course, if you delete it, you cause this accumulation of nidate. And I can tell you that the proteomic studies, it told us that this accumulation you see here is really mainly the accumulation of polynidate chains. So now the key challenge that we had to find here is that what is accumulation of nidate chains they're doing in cancer? So what is their role? So, uh, and, and how can we deal with this? So in, in a lab, in order to, to, to understand this, in a lab we're using as a model organism, um, C. elegans, like the, 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 the worms. And what we've done here is we make a, a knockout animal where we uh, deleted the, the NetP1 gene from these animals. And what we found is that this enzyme, and if you like the deletion of this enzyme, the accumulation of NetP1 that I showed you, has a very important role in the DNA damage response and apoptosis induction. So what you see here is you see the germline of the animal. And here you see the wild type animals when they're exposed to ionizing radiation. And you see the accumulation of the so-called apoptotic corpse. So this is the induction of apoptosis in the germline of, of, the, of the animal, which is the physiological response upon DNA damage. Now, in the animals where we deleted the NetP1 gene. So in the conditions where we have a lot of NEDs, like in, in tumors, DNA damage induced apoptosis was completely blocked. So basically there was no apoptosis whatsoever. And we recapitulate the same thing in human cells. So here you can see that if we, if we in this case, if we do a knockdown experiment of NetP1, we compromise the induction of apoptosis measured by caspase activity uh, you know, over here. So here we think that we found a highly conserved uh, mechanism, a pathway, that controls the apoptosis uh, in, in cells. So the conclusion of these studies is the following, is that, is that this enzyme, NetP1, its major job is to, is to constantly remove a, a net date from substrates upon DNA damage. And that is required for the DNA damage response to induce apoptosis um, in cells. Now, if you delete or if, if you um, eliminate this enzyme, you have accumulation of, the, of, of net date chains which somehow block apoptosis, which again, as I said, this recapitulates exactly what we see in, in, in tumors. Now, when you measure DNA damage, of course, you want to focus on the chromatin. And we know that these molecules that play a very important role in, in how uh, uh, the DNA damage is signaled, if you like, in the cell. So for example, ubiquitin chains or sumo chains that accumulate on the DNA damage sites, sites where they sort of send a signal for either DNA repair which can induce the cell cycle arrest in order for the system to have the time to repair the DNA damage. But if the damage is too much, it cannot be repaired, that will induce apoptosis in the cytoplasm, okay? So this is a sort of a very basic knowledge of how DNA damage can either be repaired or eventually uh, be sort of uh, um, induced in apoptosis if the damage is too, is too important. So we know that now that ubiquitin and sumo, they directly go in the sites of the DNA damage response. Now, I can tell you, and I'm not gonna show you all the data, but in our case, when we, when we look in the accumulation of net in net knockout cells, we didn't see any defect whatsoever at the chromatin level. So basically the system, the DNA repair is absolutely fine. Cell cycle array is absolutely fine, but still somehow uh, these cells, they cannot induce apoptosis. So that told us that here we have a defect that is downstream of the whole signaling pathway over here, and it's specific at the sort of induction of apoptosis in the cytoplasm, which you will see that it, it end up to be, as we call it, a protein quality control defect. Now, here just highlight very briefly how apoptosis is induced in cells uh, upon DNA damage in the cytoplasm. And a key factor here is this protein called APAF1. So this is a cytoplasmic protein, which is apoptosis um, inducing factor one. And normally it exists in a monomeric state but upon DNA damage, when the cell has to induce apoptosis, this protein gets oligomerized, and this provides a platform for all the caspases to come and bind to it, and then they get activated, and then they go and chop up the DNA in order to elic elicit uh, the, the apoptosis cells. Now, a key, a key factor for this, for this oligomerization business, if you like, that happens, is the supper on HP70. So HP70, is a saperone that normally binds to, to APAF1, but in order for APAF1 to get oligomerized, HP70 has to be released. It has to leave, it has to be activated and released by monomeric APAF1 in order to 
to, to, uh, to allow the algorithmization of APA1 in induction hypothesis. It turns out that in APO knockout cells, the defect, as I told you, is not at the chromatin level, but is indeed at this step. It basically, uh, NetP1 controls how HP7 is released from alpha 1 So here, what you see is, a, is an experiment where we monitor the interaction of alpha 1 with HP70. So here you see the interaction of these two proteins. When you put DNA damage, in this case, it's toposide, you get the release, as I said, the release of HP7 from alpha 1 but now if you look in cells where we have deleted NetP1, so basically we have a lot of NED8, this release is basically blocked. So basically this concept, this, these two proteins they are blocked and we, and we think that that's the way that somehow NED8 blocks, if you like, the formation of the apoptosome and eventually the induction of apoptosis. Now, how does this happen? We found that NED8 is directly binding to this protein HP7. But um, the, the, the outcome, if you like, of this interaction depends on the status of NED8. So HP7 can buy both to NED8 chains, which as I saw you accumulate in tumors and accumulate when we knock out NP1, but also binds to mono NED8, to free NED8. But depending on this uh, state, the outcome of HP7 activity is totally different. So in the case that NED8 is in, in a mono state, it can activate HP70 and that, allows, as I said, the release of HP7 from upper form to um, induce the apoptosome. But when we have the accumulation of NED8 chains, this um, HP7 now is inactive. It blo is blocked in the sort of um, interaction, is blocked with the monomeric upper form, and it does not allow the formation of the, of the, of the apoptosome and subsequently in the apoptosis. So now, we think we understand of how NED8 chains can actually block the induction of apoptosis by blocking the activity of HP70 and its release from, uh, from this protein called APA1. So this is just a schematic to show you uh, uh, how we think uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, NEDP1 is involved in the whole DNA damage uh, process. Its key job of this enzyme is to, is to, is to remove, if you like, uh, uh, deconjugate NED8 chains into the free NED8 chains with this sort of acting as a signal to activate the saperon, which then allows the formation of apoptosis, apoptosome and induction of apoptosis. And we think that when you block this enzyme, you accumulate uh, this uh, uh, they chains, which basically block um, all this process and then there's no um, apoptosis in cells. Now the question is, is this relevant to these tumors uh, situation that I just showed you to do? So, so what we've done here is we went back into these tumor cells, okay, that if you remember uh, these, these cells that have reduced levels of NetP1 and they have a lot of NED8. So what we've done is we put back the wild type NetP1 into these tumors and ask the question, can we now see apoptosis in these tumor cells? And this is now the, the experiment here. So here you see the induction of apoptosis in the, in the normal tumor um, uh, uh, cells, in the control cells. And it says that we put a Newton form of NetP1 that is not active. And this is a sort of induction of apoptosis, but if we put back the white type, no. so if you if you put now the wild type NetP1 in uh, in these tumors, you can restore apoptosis. So we think that this deregulation of NetP1 in these tumors um, might ha might actually have as a as a tumor suppressor function, and we think that the formation of these tumors is because the the, the decrease of uh, of NetP1 and the accumulation of NetP1. Of, of NetP1. So in terms of now of, of, of in terms now of, of, uh, of therapeutics, NetP1, as you can realize, is not a good target because um, inhibiting NetP1 will actually block the induction of apoptosis and will promote tumor growth. So it's not a good target. But the, if you remember, I told you at the beginning that this um, uh, um, NetP1 is part of a cycle which depends on the activity of the E3 enzymes that they put NED8 on, and of course NetP1 that removes NED8. So what we're trying to do at the moment is to, is to find the E3 enzymes that they make this NED8 chains that actually works with NetP1 um, um, in, in order to make, uh, to make this NED8 chains. Because we think that these enzymes will actually be um, good therapeutic um, targets to um, inhibit the formation of NED8 in tumors, which in theory should increase and induce apoptosis in these cells. So, so that was the first part was like just to show you a bit of um, sort of basic biology of how. Sort of 
of how of how um, uh, different components of the nervous system can be involved in tumor uh, progression and potential therapeutic targets. But now, what I will do in the last uh, you know five or ten minutes, I will just show you a bit uh, the um, uh, how potentially strategies that we can use uh, the nervous inhibitors in the clinics. Now, as I told you, the pathways are regulated. And because of the success of the bortezomib, the people develop inhibitors for the NED8 system, uh, which they block the, the, the E1 enzyme for, for NED8, this compound called MLF104 or Pevonedistat. So the compound is a, an AMP analog. So you can see the structure over here. It has a sulfonate group, which is different from AMP. And as I said, it's in phase three clinical trials for multiple myeloma or solid tumors. Now, a key experiment that shows the specificity of this compound, because as you can realize, in all these clinical trials and all this development of chemotherapeutics, a big question is how specific are these compounds that we're using in order to, to target and inhibit the, the protein of interest that we want to, to target in cancer. So, so what people have done uh, uh, with, with this compound is to treat uh, cell lines with very low doses of the, of the, of the compound in order to, de to, develop, to develop cell lines that they become resistant to MLF-494. And then what they've done is they took these cells that they resist to MLF-494 and they sequenced the genome in order to find what type of mutations these cells have acquired that cause the resistance to, to, this, to this compound. And what is very interesting is that in this sort of analysis, what they found is that the tumor cells that they're now resistant to MLF-494, they make mutations in the E1 enzyme where the compound binds. So now this mutation in the E1 enzyme now makes the compound that it doesn't bind to the, to the E1 enzyme um, um, anymore. So the enzyme is still active, but now the MLF-494 cannot bind to the, to, to the E1 enzyme because of this mutation. And that's how, that's how um, these tumors now, they cannot see MLF-494. But what is critical, it really shows that all the anti-tumor effects that we see of this compound is because of the inhibition of this enzyme. Okay, so that's very critical, if you like, um, um, experiment that shows the specificity of this enzyme in order to induce um, this anti-tumor um, effects through inhibition of the NED8 pathway and the NED8 T1 enzyme. Now, basically, and sort of a thing that scientists always look uh, when they test chemotherapeutics is that they induce the activation of tumor suppressors because in many ways, that's what you want to do in, 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 in tumor cells in order to um, activate tumor suppressors to, to, to actually kill the tumor cells. And a key tumor suppressor that um, scientists always look at for its activation is a P53 a tumor suppressor that I guess you all know. And it's a tumor suppressor that is mutated in almost 50% of, um, of, um, of, 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 of tumors. So of course, the rest of the tumors that have wild type 53 the compounds that they will induce the activation of P3 will be something good in order to, to eliminate or to, to kill these tumors. So MLM494 um, indeed activates P53. So that was looked at the moment promising. And that looked something good because that was, if you like, uh, give us confidence that by activating tumors like P53, MLM 494 can induce apoptosis and, and, uh, and kill tumor cells. Now, I'm not gonna go into details, but just to show you uh, that now we, we know the mechanism of how MLF-494 uh, really activates P53. And I will just mention that it um, involves the nucleolus into, into the nucleus, this compartment for which P53 is, is, is very sensitive. So now the question that we want to address is now we, we, saw, we saw that MLF-494 activates P53. What we wanted to now to understand is that how important is this activation of P53 um, for the MLM, for this compound to kill cancer cells. So um, what you normally do in this type of situations to test this hypothesis is we have a group of isogenic uh, cells, which they have either wild type P3, the colon cancer cell lines, and they have wild type P53 or no P53 at all. And then the, the idea is that you apply the compound in both cells, you measure the variability of the cells, and actually then you can tell whether the activation of P53 is very important for the killing of these, of these tumor cells. And indeed, uh, Lara, PhD student in the lab, that's what she did over here. So here you see the wild type 53 cells when treated uh, with, uh, with this, co this compound, their survival 
really declines in a, in a time dependent manner. So indeed, it's sort of that was promising that the compound has a static tumor effects. Now, the big surprise though came when we looked into P53 negative cells. So here we were expecting that the P53 negative cells will be resistant to this compound. But in contrast, what we saw is that these cells, they are actually more sensitive to the compound compared to the white type P53 cells. So in contrast to what we believed, it looks that this activation of P53 that you see here by the compound is actually protecting the cells, not killing the cells. So that was quite intriguing. And what um, um, Lara wanted to do is to wanted to try to understand why the activation of P53 was protecting these cells from, from, uh, from, from, from cell death, at least to, to some extent. So what she did is she did a cell cycle analysis using again the P53 plus less at the, at the, at the minus cells. And here you can see that the application of, of the compound is quite toxic. So here's the normal cell cycle profile. And here are the cells that are really accumulating arrest and arrest phase and they, they die from a, from, a, uh, um, uh, from a sort of an S phase you know, block. And you can see here that the MLF4 is effective in both um, wild type cells and uh, um, sort of P53 negative cells. But what Lara noticed is that specifically in the wild type 53 cells, this compound was also induced in a small G1 arrest that it was not seen in the mutant cells that was quantified over here. So Lara wanted to test the hypothesis if this G1 arrest somehow was protecting the cells from dying when applied upon application of the MLF4. So in order to, to test this hypothesis, um, um, Lara applied the trick, was basically used a compound called actinomycin D. This is um, basically a transcription inhibitor. But this compound, when you use it at a very low doses, this compound is using a cell cycle arrest, a G1 or G2 cell cycle arrest that is fully P53 dependent, okay? So now you can use this compound and you specifically can block the cells of the G1 or the G2 and ask the hypothesis if now the MLM494, the NADA inhibitor, will now be effective in these cells. So here, this, this the experiment over here. So here, what she did is it's, it's she pre-treated um, the cells, both the wild type and then minus the negative cells with actinomycin D. And you can see a G1 and G2 arrest in the wild type cells, but the negative cells that keep cycling, okay? There's no P53, so actinomycin D cannot cause this arrest. And then after the pre-treatment, she applied now the NADA inhibitor. And as you can see here in the cycling cells, the cells, the mutant cells, they are sensitive to the mnf 4 but not the wild type 53 cells because they are still arrested at the G1, G2 you know, stage. And somehow the speed treatment, it protected the cells against the, the, the net data inhibitor. Now, I will go this very fast, but actually we can see the same thing in, in, in survival assays. So here you can see that the compound is toxic both to wild type and negative, uh, wild, 53 wild type cells and negative cells. But if you do the pre-treatment with actinomycin D and then put MLF4, MLF4 kills only the mutant cells, but not the wild type cells, okay? So we also wanted to test this in a, in, in a vivo sort of situation. So for this, uh, we use a zebrafish as a model, as a model um, sort of organism. And what we did in this case, we treat this, uh, these embryos with uh, MLF4 alone or in combination with actinomycin D. And you can see here that when you treat with an NDA inhibitor, the NDA inhibitor is reducing toxicity. This is toxicity, caspase 3 um, activity, apoptosis in the, in the sort of live embryo. But if you pre-treat with actinomycin D and then put the inhibitor, now these animals are totally protected. So in many ways, what um, we think we found is a strategy to protect healthy cells against the toxicity that is induced upon MLF4 by using this pre-treatment with actinomycin D. So now, why this is important for, 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 for cancer therapy? Because in any sort of um, um, tumor situation, like um, you know, for every patient, you have two types of cells. You have your, your healthy cells, which in this case, they are you know, uh, wild type 53 positive, and you have mutant cells, tumor cells, that as I said, 50% of them, they will be uh, 53 negative. So by doing this trick, by pre-treating with a, with a, in this case, with actinomycin D, with a small, with a, with a, with a, with a 
compound that activates specifically P53 to cause a cell cycle arrest, you can block the cycle of wild type 53 cells of the healthy cells, but not of the tumor cells. And now in the second phase, these tumor cells will be very sensitive to, to in this case, to the, to the mediated inhibitor, which will cause mitotic catastrophe and apoptosis, but not the wild type cells, which again, they will be sort of um, uh, be able to recover once you remove the, 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 the treatment. So in this case, we think that you can devise an approach to prevent any toxicity of this compound that will be um, inducing in the healthy cells um, in, in every patient. So, um, and this of course is because all the chemotherapy uh, side effects, they are because of the activation of P53 in, uh, in, in, in the healthy system. So this is what we want to try to prevent by doing this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, this, this trick. So this concept, if you like, is called the P53 cyclotherapy approach. And this is to, if you like to exploit the garden of the genome to protect normal cells from the chemotherapy induced toxicity. Now, the advantage that this gives you is now by, pro by protecting the healthy cells, you can really increase the, the, the dose of the, the compound in tumor cells. So if you like the, the maximum tolerated dose, it can now be increased because now by protecting the, the normal cells against the toxicity of the compound, you can increase the dose that you can use um, in order to specifically target the tumor cells and not the healthy cells. And I will stop here. Um, it's just to thank uh, um, uh, the two key people that they do this work. So Merik Bailey, he did all the work uh, that just saw you on, on FP1. Lara uh, did all the experiments on the uh, cyclotherapy and the use of the inhibitors uh, uh, to protect, if you like, uh, wild type healthy cells against the toxic effects of the inhibitor. And so we had a fantastic collaboration with a group of, uh, of, of Malou Martin Santana in Bilbao, where she did all the, the work on hepatocarcinoma and HP1. And the work in zebrafish that I just saw you we did with a, a group uh, here in CRBA, Benedict de Laval, uh, on, on the effects of the psychotherapy. So I stop here. Thanks very much for the invitation. Um, I hope it was relatively clear. And uh, I would be very happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dimitris. Well, we have some time for questions now. I don't know if someone wants to. Well, I will start then. Um, Dimitris, I, well, I have some basic questions here. Um, I would like to, do you, do you have any, or someone has any idea of what is the percentage of, uh, what percentage of net uh, Net eight action is is uh, in a certain pathology could be attributable to to its ubiquitination regulation and what is due to uh, the regulation of other proteins. Is there any idea in a certain pathology? No, so it's it's. I mean, I think I think what is what is pretty clear is that uh, the role of Ned in controlling the as I mentioned the ubiquitin system and the the calling nickel ligases, it's the major role of of Ned. So, uh, but I have to say that from, uh, from, um, um, from experiments that we've done, it doesn't always explain every, everything. So we, we, we found sort of particular cases or you know, types of, of tumor cells that they're sensitive to all the non culling you know, targets that we, we just look. For example, hepatocellular carcinoma that I just showed you, this accumulation of nadate has nothing to do with callings. And still um, it looks that is important for the, for, the, for the tumor development. So clearly all this calling aspect that I just showed you is, is the major part by which uh, nadate operates, uh, but it doesn't explain everything. Okay. Someone has any question? I don't know, I, I'm just checking the chat here, but I don't know if there's someone else. Oh, there's some, someone, Monica. Go ahead. <laughs> you want Monica? Hola. Oh, okay. Hola. Uh, good, good morning. Thank you very much. I, I just have to go to class. So this is a very quick question. Thank you for your, for your excellent introduction. I really, really enjoyed it because I usually teach this in the medical schools. And for me, it's been really enlightening. Uh, I only have a basic question regarding chaperones. Uh, you talked about uh, HSP70, that it seems that it's a chaperone that is involved absolutely in every process in the cell, really, yes. really critical chaperone. 
and this is really new to me. But I was wondering, do you know if HSP 90, that is uh, often overexpressed in cancer, um, has any role in, in proteasome degradation like HSP 70? No, no, clearly it, it's been, I mean, I didn't talk about HSP 90 here, but clearly HSP 90, it's, uh, it's also involved in, uh, and normally they're working together with HSP 70. So these two superons, they are the major superons in the system. Uh, that they uh, uh, working together in terms to degrade the misfolded proteins. So what is, what is very interesting is that um, you see a very strong cooperation between these two proteins. So for example, when you block the activity of HP70, the system upregulates HP90 and vice versa. So um, there's a very close interdependency on, uh, on, on, on these two, um, on the function of these two chaperones, uh, but and, and, and while and while they both sort of they all sort of um, but the both of them involved in the in the in the in the degradation, if you like, of misfolded proteins, they seem to have specific targets. So each one, like group, of, they have defined group of proteins that they target each individual ones. And now there's actually studies in um, in, uh, 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 in, in in different type of cancers where they show that the deregulation of either HP70 or HP90 can have a completely different outcome in cancer progression. So yes, these two proteins are working together. Um, uh, in some cases, yes, they might, you know, controlling um, sort of similar substrates, but what is also clear is that they have distinct sort of functions to control uh, protein degradation uh, and group of proteins for, for degradation and their sort of role in, in tumor progression. And if I may ask another one, um, uh, if instead of cancer, we talk about neurodegenerating cells that have aggregates of amyloid, um, do you know if uh, anybody has explored the role of uh, either HSP-70 or in particular HSP-90 in the disassembly degradation or um, uh, whatever, a, a way to treat all these aggregates of amyloid intracellularly. Yes, so what is absolutely clear now is that uh, especially HP70 is absolutely essential for the formation of these um, um, toxic aggregates into the, into the cell, but also for the elimination. So uh, these this, this, this aggregates that we see in, in neurons, um, they have different sort of phases and qualities. So there are aggregates that they are formed but some kind, sometimes they can be sort of eliminated, they can be reversed, they can be eliminated by the system, but there are other type of aggregates that they are completely uh, irreversible and they just stay there forever. Now, the ones that are getting the reversible ones, the elimination strictly depends on HP70. So of course, when you block HP70, you make these aggregates now to becoming irreversible. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's not still very clear, of course, uh, if HP70 is a good therapeutic target for these cases, maybe probably not, uh, because if you block HP70, you, most likely you will induce um, aggregation of proteins. But what's absolutely clear is that um, HP70 is essential for the formation of aggregates in this uh, in these pathologies. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the your talk. I really, really enjoyed it. It's been brilliant. I really love your, your, your models and your slides. Very enlightening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry, I have to go now to class. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. We are very jealous about your Western blots. Uh, we, we, we would like to have those, the, you know, those nice Western blots you show. <laughs> well, do you have any questions, someone else? Well, I have another one, just uh, uh, some basic one too. Um, do you know how shifting is the nebulome? I mean, uh, is something like the when when you extract proteins from a certain cells or a certain pathology, you extract the, the proteins and uh, you have to add, you know, uh, anti uh, um, kinases, anti phosphatases. Is this the case for for nebulization? Is it is it that shifting since it's a reversible process? Yes. Yeah, so actually, um, so so these pathways, we think that they are even more sensitive um, compared to phosphorylation in terms of removing and losing the modification. So the 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 deconjugating enzymes they are extremely extremely active. 
So um, if you don't take any precautions to inhibit these enzymes, um, when, when you lyse the cells, um, everything, everything will disappear. And actually, in many ways, th that's, that, that's one of the reasons why ubiquitin as a post translational modification, which was really much later, uh, came in the field, um, like in terms of how many proteins they get in uh, ubiquitin. Because in the past, when people were doing Western blood analysis, they were lysing the cells without any inhibitors, without anything. And of course, all the modifications were disappeared. So we never used to see ubiquitin, you know, modifications in the past because of this reason. And once you put the inhibitors, I mean, the whole picture completely changes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So any more questions? Well, I don't know if we, there's some, some other question in the other chat. Uh, no, there is none. Nothing? Nothing. Okay. So, well, maybe we should start, stop here. Thank you, Dimitris, for your nice okay, talk. Thanks. Thanks again to all of you. Thanks for listening. <laughs> we'll keep in touch. Yeah. We'll keep it that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. And